Hello there everyone and welcome back to my channel. In the past couple of weeks, I have seen a dramatic increase in the number of questions that I've been receiving about how to teach online. This video is the start of a brand new series that focuses in on how you can get started using Zoom as a digital or virtual classroom for your students. This series will lead you right from the very beginning of getting signed up for Zoom through to hosting your own online sessions with your students. Today, we're going to cover the first two steps. We're going to sign up for a Zoom account and we're going to go through our settings to make sure we have the proper settings in place for when we do schedule meetings for our students. To get started, we need to open up a web browser and go to zoom.us. Here, you will be able to sign up for a free Zoom account. That can be done by clicking on the blue Sign Up It's Free button in the upper right hand corner. You can choose to either sign up with your email address or if you have a Google account, you can sign in directly with Google. When prompted, enter your Google account email or if you would like to, you could create a Google account. Click Next and then proceed to enter the password for your Google account. Once again, click Next, and then you will be welcome to Zoom and verify that you want to create a Zoom account using your Google account. Once you click on Create Account, you will be brought to your Zoom Meetings dashboard. This is the screen where you can schedule new meetings or view previous meetings or upcoming meetings. Now, we'll discuss this screen in more detail in the second video of this series. For now, we are going to focus in on the settings tab and figure out what some of those ideal settings are for when we are planning online classes for students. Generally, I choose not to start the Zoom meeting with the host video and participants video turned on. I usually leave them off until it is officially time to start our session together. I will usually begin class by sharing my Google slide deck, the welcome screen, and I have a five minute countdown video uh, that goes so the, the students know exactly how much time they have until we officially start class. The next setting to take a look at is the join before host. I always make sure that that is turned off. I do not want my students joining before I do. I find that it's just best practice to do that, uh, especially since I work with younger students, so middle school, high school, uh, these are not university aged um, students at all. And so the potential for things to happen does exist if they're there without an adult. And so I always choose to make sure that it is turned off, that they are not allowed to join before I do. Here you have the choice of whether or not you would like to require a password for the meetings that you schedule. Uh, for me, in general, I don't require a password for mine, uh, mostly because it's just within my school setting that any of the Zoom links get shared. Uh, and I also have other safety protocols in place to make sure that it's only my students who are logging into my online sessions. This next one is pretty important. You do want to make sure that you mute participants upon entry. If you don't, especially if you're dealing with elementary age children or even middle school and high school sometimes, um, it can get quite noisy in the class and depending on whether or not students have headphones in, um, you can also get some feedback if everybody has their microphone on at the same time. So make sure that you click um, enable for the mute participants upon entry. Now, depending on your own personal preferences and the students that you work with, you may or may not want to enable chat. Uh, in my classes, I do allow the chat box, but I put limitations on it. Um, I do not allow students to have private chat. Private chat between students 
opens up opportunity for things like bullying and inappropriate comments, as well as distracted behavior. Um, and so that is why I don't allow private chat between students. I do, however, allow chat in general as a public comment uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, for those students that uh, may be a little shy to raise their hand and speak on the microphone, it is a way with fewer barriers from, for some students. Uh, the other option too is um, it is a way for as I'm talking or sharing something with the class for a student to share their idea without interrupting the general flow of class and so after a certain section is done or whatnot I can take a look at the chat and catch up and answer any questions that maybe came up as I was speaking or sharing something. I also like to enable auto saving chats that way it saves to my computer and I'm able to reference it if I ever need to. I don't enable play sound when participants join or leave. I have in previous years but, but I found it rather distracting actually when that would happen. Um, and my class sizes are small enough that I can notice when a student joins or leaves. And so I've disabled that for my own classes. For file transfers, I generally keep that turned off and don't allow the sharing of different files in class. Uh, in years past, I have had students who have accidentally shared different meme files in class. Obviously, that can be quite distracting, and so I do want to limit those types of distractions in class. If there is something, so for example, if there's a file that I need to share with the students and I know that that's something that I'm going to need, then before I start the class, I'll go to my settings, turn it on, launch the Zoom session. And then once I'm finished, I'll come back to my settings and turn it off again for any future Zoom sessions that I start. Enabling the allow host to put attendee on hold is a very useful feature and one that I haven't had to use a whole lot, but one that I do remind students I can do. It allows you to remove a student from the Zoom session if you need to. So say for example, you have a student who's being disruptive, it's not listening, um, whatever the situation might be, um, you are able to remove that student if this setting is enabled. Now, obviously these next ones are personal preference, but I always enable the showing meeting control toolbar, as well as showing Zoom windows during screen share. I do enable both of those for my meetings. I do allow screen sharing in my Zoom sessions. Uh, so both I can share as well as my students can share. I share my Google slide slide deck um, for a number of different things. Um, their welcome screen in the morning with their countdown, um, various pictures or text or whatnot um, to help out along with my lessons. Uh, but oftentimes we will do um, group projects or individual projects where students are um, are creating their own slide decks and so they share them in class as well. Now the only thing to be careful of with this is that you want to make sure that your Zoom links are secure before you enable this. So for example, um, I only release my, my Zoom links to my students and it's a secure setting. I don't have um, people from outside my school joining my Zoom classes. Um, but if you've heard in the news recently with everyone um, now using the Zoom platform and things like that, there have been some public events where people have joined and this setting has been turned on and then you get random people sharing inappropriate pictures and things on their screen. Um, so you don't want that to happen. So if you do have this enabled, make sure that you are sharing your class link to Zoom in a secure setting. Enabling annotations can be very handy. This allows uh, you and the students to be able to make annotations with something that is being shared. So for example, if I had a slide deck screen that was being shared with a math problem, uh, then we could annotate what's being shared to work out the math problem together. Along the same lines, enabling a whiteboard in Zoom is very handy. That makes it one of the choices of things that you can share 
Uh, so instead of sharing your screen with a slide deck on it, you can choose the whiteboard option and it brings up just exactly that, a whiteboard that you can draw on. I also like to make sure that the whiteboard is auto saved when you switch between content sharing. Uh, sometimes you might be working on something on the whiteboard and maybe you'll have to go back and share another screen or you just wanna go back to the camera look. Um, that way, when if you do that switching, you come back, everything that you had written on your whiteboard is still there. I do enable nonverbal feedback. In Zoom, it provides students with icons that they can click on that allows them to communicate with you without actually like using the microphone or anything. So for example, there's things like um, speed up, slow down. Um, there's, there's actually a coffee cup as one of the, uh, the things. There's a, a green check mark, there's a red X. Um, and some of those items I actually use to even pull the students. So for example, if I have a yes, no question, I might say, if your answer is yes, give me a green check mark, or if your answer is no, give me a red X. So there's lots of things that you can do with that. I find it to be a handy tool to have access to. Breakout rooms. These are essential for group work. I love them. I do make sure that those are enabled as well. I also like the option to assign the participants to what breakout room they will be going to. Um, so I do make sure that I allow that. Um, Zoom does have the ability to randomly assign students to a group. So sometimes I'll use that, but sometimes I will have specific groupings that I want students in. And so being able to have that option is really nice. Enabling a virtual background can be really neat. Uh, so there are some really neat things that you can do with that. Just be aware that with more and more students now on Zoom, they are, of course, being students and finding very interesting things to do with these virtual backgrounds. Uh, so make sure that you're always engaging your students because some of them might be recording videos of them at their screen setting it as a virtual background and then walking away. I have seen video instructions from students making its rounds um, around social media. So just be aware of that if you do enable virtual backgrounds. Attention tracking is the next setting that I always make sure is enabled. Now with attention tracking turned on, what you're able to do when you are sharing your screen in Zoom, Zoom tells you whether or not students are in the Zoom window or if they have moved to something else on their computer. So I do find this quite handy. Um, students find it very interesting that I know when they are not paying attention. Um, and so this is one of the ways that um, I am able to do that. So attention, attention tracking um, is, does come in handy. I also enable the waiting room function. What this does is students, when they log in, they get placed in the waiting room. They are told that the host will let them in when it's time. Um, and so that allows me to uh, not only be able to log in and make sure I'm all set before the students start showing up, but it also allows me to see who's trying to log into the class and then I can choose who I allow in. So say for example, if you know my link got out there somehow and somebody that I did not know or recognize was trying to log into my Zoom session, they actually wouldn't be able to get into class unless I let them in. The final meeting session that I like to make sure is enabled is the show a join from your browser link. What this does is it allows students to simply click on a link to join the Zoom session within their browser and they're not required to download the Zoom client in order to access their classes. Now you as a host We'll have to do the download your very first time and we'll go into that um, in our, our next video in this series. Um, but if you enable the show a join from your browser link, that assures that your students don't have to or are not required to do that download. They can simply click on the link and launch the Zoom session. That final section there of the settings has to do with email notifications and what you like to receive and whatnot. And of course, that really boils down to personal preference. All right, now that we have signed up for Zoom and explored the various settings that we can have as part of our online sessions, we are ready 
to learn how to schedule a meeting. And that's what we're going to be learning in the very next video of this series. So if you haven't done so yet, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell to make sure that you get a notification when that next video is posted. Thanks so much, guys. We will see you in the next video.